so some topics come up more and more often the older I get. And the specific topic which comes up the most, and the most often lately, for me, is HMS Unicorn. And why does she come up? Well, it's not just because she's not an aircraft carrier. Although she wasn't. She was a forward aviation support ship. It's a completely different thing. But it's important to the year of the aircraft carrier. It comes up because there's... How do I put this? I have seen a lot of people who are thoroughly sure of themselves that they know what she, the reason she was built. And I've heard them talk. And I've read their books. And they always tell me it's something. It's one thing. It's one thing they'll focus in on. And we'll be discussing that when we're going to. And the reality is they are missing the point. I, in a video not too long ago, have said that the Implacables are really the true expression of what the British wanted from an aircraft carrier. It is true. Interestingly enough, at the same time as they are laying those down, and they're going to be the model of future carriers to be built, and let's be honest, the Royal Navy knows that with the treaties now gone, the odds are it'll be able to get as many, get whatever carriers it wants, and so it can replace all its older carriers when it needs to, and maybe even grow the fleet, with the new implacable star carriers or something bigger, they lay down Unicorn. And they are planning to lay down others of her class. She will not be alone. The question becomes, why? And that's what this video is entirely about. It's about conception, operation, and conclusion. There is a key ships video about HMS Unicorn on this channel, which was published in 2024 on the 19th of January. It's key ship series eight, ship one, HMS Unicorn. Honestly, not an aircraft carrier. And this video is in many ways a partner of that video. There will, of course, be, to an extent, some overlap between the two. There always is. You can't divorce the technology and service record from the conception, operation, and conclusion. Either way. But you are, each video is going to have a different emphasis and a different point. So hopefully they complement each other rather than destroy each other. And hopefully I've managed to put a link into the video above. <laughs> we cross fingers. So Unicorn, why is she not an aircraft carrier? Why is she not a carrier? Why is she a forward aviation support ship? Why does Admiral Henderson make her so? Well, there are lots of reasons, truly. There are lots of reasons. With that in mind, this front side might not be inappropriate, but this will be. I know, you're expecting it to be the Seamus book plug. That will still be coming, but that's the next slide, not this slide. So, first of all, we have to start talking about Admiral Henderson, the gentleman at the top here. And Stanley Goodall, the Director of Construction, Third Sea Lord. So, pretty much, Henderson and... I can go so far in terms of writing this in a book, and I can go so far in terms of saying this in a video, because I can say it with the full context in a video, far more than I can in a book. Pretty much seems to have ended up with an agreement with Chatfield. If you read around the lines, you look at what goes through, the Chatfield gets to push through the 14-inch guns for the King George V over the objections of pretty much everyone else in the Navy. And in return, Henderson pretty much gets to control almost everything else that's being constructed. The only... Um, basically, Chatfield only gets to 
argue against things when he really wants to. And really, and when I say really wants to, I mean he really wants to run in for an argument. Um, one of the greatest things is that that you see in letters, and this tells you their professional relationship, because I think they still were courteous and kind of outside of work, etc., but their professional relationship we got to, was that Chatfield makes a big song and dance about larger ships, larger destroyers requiring more crew and that being expensive. And that's his whole point of his argument, and Henderson writes a whole letter back to him, arguing his other points, everything. And then the main point, he says, you're sincerely, you know, RGH Henderson. And then at the bottom, he puts, P.S., just to clarify, sort of thing. Um, larger destroyers actually require less crew than small destroyers because you can get more easy access to machinery. So it requires less crew hours to perform routine maintenance. And gives the facts and figures. And I do, I have shown it on this channel on the slide. And Henderson could get away with that as third sea lord because pretty much Chatfield to get his way on the 14 inch guns for the King George V against all the structural opposition in the Navy has pretty much handed over a blank check for all other construction to Henderson. Henderson doesn't get the large L class a large L class he wanted, he gets a smaller L class. But honestly that's put through as a balance with other things he does get, so it's pretty much, he gets most of what he wants most of the time. And one of the things he does get is Unicorn. And one of the things I love is that this is, Norman Freeman even points out this, that Unicorn is pushed through by Henderson. So what's his vision? Well, the argument is all often made post-Abyssinia crisis. That the Royal Navy realized it needed a depot ship for its aircraft carriers, rather like it had for its submarines and destroyers. Small problem with that is that Henderson starts talking about this sort of ship while he's Rear Admiral Aircraft Carriers. Back in 1931. Four years before the Abyssinia Crisis. So the question becomes, is the Abyssinia Crisis justification for what he wants, or the reason he wants what he wants? And there is a difference there. There is a difference because that means that the designs which suddenly appear are not reacting to a crisis and trying to build of it, but are really, oh, we've now got justification. Here's what we have. And the justification is played up to the Treasury. By the point he's putting through the argument for Unicorn, he's not getting any pushback from the Navy. He's pretty much, everyone who can push back has been in somewhere or other, either converted or hobbled. So the Abyssinia crisis serves as a justification, really, to the Treasury. We're spending this money because Abyssinia has given us proof of what we've already worked out in exercises we need. Because, let's be honest, that's where Henderson's drawing his information from. It's the exercise he ran as rear animal aircraft carriers. It's what he took part in. It's the multi-fleet operations and multi-carrier operations. So that's where it's coming from. And that's what he's thinking about. And that's what he's doing. So this is the reality we're dealing with. Henderson's vision. Yeah, that was, uh, that was interesting. What's that about? What is that about? Well, his vision is for a self-sufficient fleet to be able to operate on the other side of the world from Britain. Because that's what it has to be. The toughest job the British could face, the Royal Navy could face, is to fight the Japanese. Not in terms of fighting them. You have to understand the British expect to outnumber them comprehensively. In supporting and sustaining that fleet and operations needed to conduct a successful war the other side of the world from their logistics uh, system. And the British line of base and infrastructure go through the Mediterranean, stretch round, uh, uh, through the Indian Ocean, 
and will be stretched and probably taken and resecured up the South China Sea, up the East China Sea, and probably way high way with maybe a forward base in Korea is what they're sort of looking at for their operations against Japan. With amphibious operations being used to secure that all the way. And that's another reason why the British and the Royal Navy especially are investing so much in developing amphibious warfare capabilities. I.e. landing craft, what kind of tanks they want to carry for them. Uh, you know, I've done a, did a video about this recently that the Royal Navy were actually wanting big, uh, a capacity to take larger tanks than the British Army thought would ever be built. The Royal Navy had done their own study and decided that no tanks are going to get a lot bigger than you think, so we are going to study that. We're going to have landing craft cable for it. It's a good job they did. Those landing craft turned out to be very useful in World War II when they were carrying tanks which were still slightly lighter than the Royal Navy had prepared them for. And that's again this gentleman. This gentleman. And his willing partner in crime, Stanley Goodall. And they have a really interesting time with it. Now they don't always have always have the greatest relationship, let's be honest, when Henderson wants to push through certain ideas for an aircraft carrier, occasionally wakes till Goodall's out the way. But quite often more often than not they work very solidly together. And Unicorn is a good example of this. Because let's be honest, what's Henderson also worried about in a war? Britain would have to mass produce a carrier fleet, i.e., like the Essexes, were, ma were mass ordered by the Americans. He looks at British yards, he looks at the speed to construct ships. There is a reason that when they are creating the light fleet carrier, they basically go copy paste with some modifications. It's not a surprise. It's not even a surprise to anyone who's watching the Royal Navy. The only people it might have been a surprise to who might have been fooled is the Treasury and the politicians. Probably the politicians more than the Treasury. The politicians for whom he claimed, he, he said, honestly, it is not an aircraft carrier. It's about supporting aviation around the world. And... That is her conception. The fact that to do that role, she needs to be very, very similar to an aircraft carrier, and the only full-service capable maintenance service, that is, carrier, built in this time period. She is the only aircraft carrier, or rather aviation support ship, in the world that can carry out the full range of maintenance required for ma for keeping aircraft operational, up to and including the major rebuilds of aircraft. She has things like a lighter, that is a sort of self-propelled barge, that can be lowered into the water to go and collect aircraft from carriers where those aircraft cannot fly to her. She has two sizes of lift, just in case an aircraft comes with really big damage. And while she has a catapult to assist in taking off, and a lot of facilities for landing, as you'll see, two crash barriers, all these arrestor cables, she is very much orientated around being able to maintain and repair those aircraft. She also has, quite interesting enough, some Fairly extensive, although not massive, but extensive for what her role was supposed to be, command and control facilities. This will come in useful later on in her career. She's not a flagship by any stretch of the imagination, please do not get that item near her head. But because of her role, she was felt that she would need to coordinate with a lot of other ships and be dealing with a lot of information coming in from other ships and sending out information to other ships. So she's given some enhanced facilities vis-a-vis -vis her size and her role would normally have justified. And she's all about support of aviation. Now I did promise Shameless Book Plug would come up and of course it's going to come up. Now when I did my PhD on aircraft carriers, literally my PhD thesis is about aircraft carriers, its literal title is What Value to Dark Blue Sky? 
and hopefully by the time this video comes out, it is live on the King's College on the website and you can go and download it if you want. My supervisor was Professor Andrew Lambert, the Lawson Chair of Naval History in the War Studies Department there. Leaving that to one side, after that, I wrote this book. And I wrote this book because after spending so many years in aircraft carriers, I wanted to think about something else for another couple of years. I didn't realize this would end up being my COVID work. I didn't realize this would end up being the thing that lived in my head for as long as it did. And I like it. But the joy of being an academic in the UK is it's not even publish or perish. It's publish or get ignored and forgotten. And if your books don't do well and aren't circulating well and aren't being sold well, you disappear. So, I can do as many videos as I like and I really like doing videos because I love sharing my passion for naval history and I really do in thank everyone who likes, shares and subscribes to the videos because that really does help the channel grow and helps me spread and love naval history. But if I want to get anywhere in academia, if I want a pension, if I want a teaching post where I get to regularly talk to students and I don't have to keep hustling for for new contracts every year, I've got to sell a lot of books. So, I advertise. Thank you for that. And thank you for those who support the channel directly with things like Patreon and Ko-fi and memberships. Those really do help with buying all the books needed, with doing some of the research trips I'm going to be doing, and those are going to grow dramatically once the move's out the way. As anyone who's ever been through moving house will tell you, and I seem to I seem to forget this every time before after I move, and then remember it once I'm back in the trauma of moving again. Although traditionally it hasn't been moving the family home, it's just been moving myself between various positions. Um, moving house is expensive. I'm starting to wonder whether the medieval people who stayed put in one village their whole lives were merely doing that because they didn't want to pay the moving fees. Although, there again, there wasn't Pickford's or Britannia or all the other moving companies in that period, so probably it was very difficult to, and they had other issues which would stop them moving. But still, it's expensive. So at the moment it's, I will do my research and writing while working from wherever I'm technically at home. And once the home's over, uh, moves over, and my account starts to look remotely, I know, positive, then I can start doing trips again. Now, the problem that's often postulated for Unicorn's existence is the idea that the illustrious class couldn't carry enough aircraft and didn't have enough facilities. And this is usually reference to the Ark Royal, which did have more space, because the Ark Royal was the strike carrier for the Royal Navy, and these were the fleet carriers for the Royal Navy. And they had different purposes. But as mentioned earlier, this problem comes a cropper when you start to think that, well, Unicorn is laid down on the 26th of June 1939, having been ordered on the 14th of April 1939. HMS Implacable and HMS Indefatigable, two ships which certainly do have the space, as well as the armour, so are basically the Royal Navy's dream carrier, are laid down on the 21st of March 1939 and the 3rd of November 1939. So one of them is literally laid down a month, almost, before Unicorn is even ordered. And to be honest, they were ordered even earlier. So, hang on. If the cumulative limit on ships ton on carrier tonnage has disappeared in the Second London Naval Treaty, 1937, and Britain can now build as many 27,000 standard, ton uh, standard tonnage carriers as they want, and let's be honest, the implacable class turn into 32,630 tons in deep load, so yes, 27,000 standard tons is honestly what they were. 
Um, and they no longer have to build the 23,000 ton ships. Although they've still built them because they'd already ordered and worked everything out and got all the long lead items and so we're still building them. Rather than changing a design through the construction up to the implacable class level, which would probably have not affected their time venture at all as long as they hadn't been paused like Churchill paused them when it came to power, but leaving that to one side. Uh, why? Why? These ships, they can be used in areas, the Royal Navy has enough areas in its global operations, to, in areas where you, like the Mediterranean, can't they? They can be used in the spaces where the Royal Navy's not going to be without support, uh, aviation support. They're going to have plenty of bases to provide the aviation support. But the problem is always put forward, oh no, it, Unicorn is built to support the armoured carriers because they can't sustain themselves. They actually do carry a lot of stores and can do quite a lot of repairs. They are... Certainly equivalent to the US and Japanese counterparts in terms of level of repair they can do aboard the carrier. But the thing is, it was never about this. It was never about the Abyssinia crisis. Yes, yes the illustrious class were a compromise on what the Royal Navy really wanted, just as Ark Royal had been a compromise on what the Royal Navy really wanted because of the treaty limitations. And yes... The forward aviation sh support ship does allow you to go through a loophole in the treaty wording. It does allow you to build the ship through the, tr the treaty wording limitations. And so even if some sort of cumulative limitation is implied later, you can get it. But it's not about supporting Unicorn, uh, the illustrious class. Unicorn is not about supporting the illustrious class so much as in operations in the Mediterranean, as it is the closest thing to a ship which is actually built for Far Eastern operations. You see, quite regularly, I will get someone commenting in a video that Ark Royal was built for the Pacific, and that was why she's built the way she is, because she looks like the American carriers and the Japanese carriers, so she must have been built for the Pacific. And I will go, well, let's go look at the actual, what the Royal Navy officers at the time were saying and doing and what they're talking about with her. And you find out she's the strike carrier, which is designed to deliver on the Royal Navy's harbour attack commitments. And actually to give it some sort of alpha strike or full deck strike, uh, or full deck load, um, deck load strike, etc., whilst also in co cooperation with the other carriers in their task force. And they're always looking at a multi-carrier operation. The Royal Navy, and this is the cruelty of World War II, realistically, the Royal Navy spend most of the time from 1931 onwards, 1930, they started looking at it, 1931 onwards, thinking about multi-carrier operations. They have a huge doctrine around it. They have all sorts of ideas of multiple carriers and how they're going to work together and how they're going to cooperate. And they have ideas for how carriers are going to operate solo as part of task forces with fast capital ships to hunt down surface raiders. And then they're going to come together for fleet actions and they're going to be able to work with each other. With things like the fleet carriers, i.e. the illustrious class, the ones which are armored, having to take lead and point within the formation within the fleet while the strike carrier is sort of hidden off to an extent to provide that punch when you need it but not to be as up threat up risk as the other carriers and in a way to feed its aircraft through them and that's designed the idea is pretty much based around the treaty limitations and them continuing and the government continuing to subscribe to them the problem that exists though for all of that is the British can do that easily in the North Atlantic. They've got tons of logistics, infrastructure. I mean, look, they've got the whole of the UK sitting in the North Atlantic. In the Mediterranean, they've got huge industrial, uh, huge sort of infrastructure hubs in Gibraltar, in Malta, in Alexandria. And the uh, the whole Suez area, in many regards, they've got all these facilities to support things. That's great. And then you go to the Indian Ocean, you go, well, hang on, the base is starting to fend down. Here. Got a fairly decent one at Bombay. We've got a fairly decent one at Ceylon, and we've got a decent one at Singapore. 
but how much are we actually are we actually getting funding to invest in the infrastructure and grow these and keep them capable? How much are local colonial governments willing to pay? What have we got in Australia? What have we got? Oh, that's becoming an issue. And then you start going further than that. Okay, right. Once we're past Singapore, what have we got? Hong Kong. Do we expect that to fall in the case of a war with Japan? Well, if it doesn't, they're being stupid. Because realistically, they should chuck everything at it when they can. This is why our format point is Singapore, is to send the fleet out to and then move up, not Hong Kong. Because we honestly expect Hong Kong to minimum be under siege and maximum have fallen. And we have to retake it or see or relieve the siege. What about a more northern base? Way high way. Oh, that'll be gone. That's gone, definitely. And, okay. We want to fight a war with Japan by imposing a blockade on them. We will need a forward base. In Korea. Probably, to do it properly. That's the British sort of plan. And where they're working from. So they're basically going to set up a theatre base at Wei Hai Wei. A forward base in Korea. A convoy routing base in Hong Kong slash fallback base. And Singapore is the regional entry base with all the most forward heavy infrastructure. And that means you've got to support those multi-carrier battle groups over thousands of miles Thousand, half a world away from your home infrastructure industrial base. Frigate, that's going to be a tough one, is it? And that. And so then comes Long HMS Unicorn. Suddenly, she starts to make a lot of sense when you start to consider this. Now, she can be used for other things elsewhere in the world. And this is the point: the Royal Navy doesn't build anything which is a theater specific specific ship. They're, all their ships are supposed to be able to use everywhere in the world they might need them. And the British Empire stretches the whole world, so that means they pretty much need to defend the whole world. That's what the Navy's for. But in her case, the strongest argument for her is not supporting forces dealing with the Italians in the Mediterranean. There's infrastructure there, there's industry, it's already being built. All the stuff needed to do it, it's already being built, and the airfields are being done. You don't need her there for that. But in the Far East, where you can't build infrastructure, and where you haven't built enough infrastructure on the bits you do can build infrastructure, you're going to need something like her. And you're going to need lots of somethings like her, probably, to support a large fleet. This is the problem the Royal Navy is facing. And this is the problem the Royal Navy's been facing from the get-go in the 1920s. And we're talking, in this scenario, a history, as it actually happened. In January 1939, January 1940, they are pointing guns at the Japanese, and the Japanese are pointing guns at them. Well, January 1940, they, it's, it, it's the Asamamaru incident. It's not really so much the Japanese are pointing guns back at them as the Japanese are going, you just pretty much took the pride of our merchant fleet hostage off the coast of Japan. And when we say coast of Japan, we're talking the Pacific coast of Japan, not the East China Sea, not the, uh, uh, the side of Japan. Why? Because she was carrying some German merchant sailors trying to get back to Germany. By going across the Pacific from America to Japan, and then from Japan they were hoping to go to Russia and travel through Russia to get to Germany. And the British plucked them out of the uh, out of the ocean, literally off the coast of Japan. HMS Liverpool. Pro the year before, HMS Birmingham. Along with a sloop, had had a quite literal staring contest involving guns staring at each other with the Japanese Navy over the SS Vincent the Paul in Singtao, or modern day Qingdao. 
And you can go back. There are gunboats getting attacked. There are ships pointing guns at each other. Pretty much for most of the prior decade, there is at least something happening almost every six months. So yes, this is the problem the Royal Navy is preparing for. Why? Because long before Hitler comes to power, long before Mussolini gets ants in his pants, the Japanese were causing major problems. And they are the worst case scenario because you fight you find yourself fighting Germany, well you've got all the you've got the all the infrastructure of Britain close by to support sustain you in those operations. You find yourself fighting Italy. Again, you've got the infrastructure, you've already got a Mediterranean, and Britain is not that far away. It's not half a world away. You find yourself de having to deal with a problem with Japan when you're having to send the fleet out. You've got issues. Serious issues. This is where Unicorn comes in. So now that, let's look at Unicorn. Let's look at why she was a solution to this problem. She's designed from the get-go to have huge capacity for stores and huge capacity for space for aircraft. In modern terminology, we actually probably wouldn't call her lower hangar a hangar. We'd probably call it a flex deck rather than a hangar because it is an incredibly flexible space. It can be used as a storage dump for all sorts of equipment. It can be used as a storage dump for containerized aircraft. It can be used as a heavy maintenance bay where you can literally tuck aircraft which are going to take a long time to repair out of the flow of movement in the main hangar and work on them. Literally rip them apart, take everything off them and rebuild them. You can do that in that space. That's what it's designed as. And it's designed with store space and everything around it and shop space, i.e. machine shop space around it. And that's the reason why it's, it's kind of a strange arrangement. If you consider the aircraft hangars, and well, the hangars as they're called, the upper hangar is 324 foot by 65 foot, so it's wider, 324 foot long, remember that one. The lower hangar is 360 foot by 62 foot, so the lower hangar is actually 36 foot longer. Three foot narrow, but 36 foot longer. Now, the upper hangar also has the advantage of the lighter, which I discussed earlier, can be can be lifted up right to level it, so you can literally wheel aircraft off the lighter into the upper hangar, and you store the lighter underneath the lip at the back of the air and back of HMS Unicorn. She's therefore very well equipped with space-wise to sustain aircraft coming in and repairing them. And both those hangars, well... They're both 16 foot and 6 inches high. That means both hangars are higher than even the lower hangar of Indomitable, the fourth of the illustrious class vessels. And higher than the lower hangar in the Implacable class, which again was 16 foot. The upper hangar on the Implacables being 14 foot. So, this hangar, these hangars are specifically designed to have more space than you'd have in your regular hangars. What do you design your carry, carry aircraft for? Design it for your normal hangars. So, by making this carrier specifically have hangars which are bigger than your normal ones, means you have far more space per aircraft to maintain and get around it. You are far more able to envelop it with the necessary maintenance crew to do the necessary work. Now, she wasn't exactly a fast ship. 24... Not top speed, 7,000 nautical miles at 13 and a half knots. She's got cruising focus for a Holland engine design, far more than she has high speed dash desire for it. But she's got enough. She's got two inches of armor on the flight deck. She's got magazines which have two to three inches of armor around them, depending on what side you're looking at. And the bulkheads have roughly one and a half inches. And there's a dispute over how many aircraft she could exactly carry, but usually it's listed as roughly 33 to 36 in operational conditions. Enough aircraft, then. Enough for her to do her role. And a lot more 
when she's carrying those aircraft in boxed up conditions. And this is what she's designed for. She's designed to provide the Royal Navy with sustainment wherever they're operating in the world. Now, the thing is, as I've already made the case, she's primarily, I would say, focused on Far Eastern deployments. But let's be honest, a ship like this, with the capabilities of maintenance she has, can be used to bolster the facilities you have back in the UK, let alone the facilities you have in the Mediterranean. She's going to be useful no matter what the situation you find yourself in. The fact that she's most useful in a scenario where you are the other side of the world from your industrial base will leave to one side. And this leads us to her service, because believe it or not, despite the delays introduced in actually launching and commissioning her, thanks to Churchill's very World War One inspired decision, and I, I, I make I've got to do a video, a full video about that decision someday because I make so many sides of it. it it's it's horrendous, but it is a very impactful decision on World War Two and on the effects of World War Two. And the reality is, she's paused. They decide to speed up her completion by not installing all the shops and all the other facilities she'd need for her full forward aviation support vessel. No, no, no. Uh, she's completed pretty much in light fleet carrier mo mode. And she's used in that. She's used in that to go off and assist in S with Salerno and other operations. She's the flagship for Philip Vian. While he's doing operations for Operation Avalanche, which are the landing of Salerno, and Salerno and is in charge of Force V. She does all sorts of interesting little operations. She even escorted convoys to Gibraltar. It was thanks to her that sea fires at Salerno were kept operating as long as they were, because even in her reduced state, her reduced state of maintenance capability versus her planned state of maintenance capability, she was still better than anything else they had out there by a country mile. And she kept on going. In 1943, she is sent back to be, well, fully configured. And then she joins the reinforcements heading out to the Far East, to the Eastern Fleet. Uh, such vessels as Illustrious, the aircraft carrier, pictured here. This is Illustrious. This is a Unicorn. Illustrious. Unicorn. Fleet Carrier. Forward Aviation Support Ship. You can even see the great big hole which connects into the stir uh, into the, uh, the aft hangar. Hey, by gum, that's a great big hole. And, well, she goes out to the Eastern Fleet with Illustrious, Renown, Queen Elizabeth, Valiant, and some other reinforcements. She takes some aircraft operating from her for the operation and for travelling out, but she also takes a huge number of stored aircraft. And she's out there for 1944 supporting the Eastern Fleet. And then she's set up with, well, a little bit of a refit again at Bombay. And during that time, she's modified to have separate workshops and additional equipment to accommodate maintaining American engines, which use different screw threads, after all, than British engines, and American electrical fittings, not just British ones. So she could maintain aircraft which came from the UK or aircraft which came from America. It didn't matter. She could deal with both. She had all that space. And then she's transferred to the British Pacific Fleet. Where she goes on to take part in operations supporting them. And fully, fully assists. Again, supporting Admiral Philip Vian, who's in charge of the aircraft carriers at this point in the British Pacific Fleet. There is often a little bit of a debate that if he that he might have considered making her his flagship again, because 
it was one of the running jokes his staff had that were out there with him. That it had actually been easier to accommodate a staff on Unicorn than it was aboard the carriers he was given as flagships in the, in the British Pacific Fleet. And it caused less of a disruption. Because as a maintenance carrier with maintenance facilities, she was designed with a lot of visiting officer space, i.e. pilots flying aircraft in and flying them back out. But mostly, most of her accommodation is designed around ratings. So she actually had space. And the main trouble they had with most of the flagships they were operating in the British Pacific Fleet was the amounts of personnel aboard had grown dramatically beyond which had been planned pre-war. Aircraft required more maintainers. There were more aircraft operating from the carriers, for starters, because they changed from being strike-heavy carriers to being fighter-heavy carriers, which fighters take up less space than strike aircraft, so you have more of them. Which means you need more fitters. Which means you also need more pilots. More planners and squadron support team and all sorts of things. And then you want to add in an admiral staff to it as well. And you can look through the Royal Navy's carrier fleet. And Admiral Henderson is regularly found putting the case holding designs they needed more flag space. They needed more flag space. They needed space for flag officers. The Implacables and Ark Royal are where he actually wins those arguments. In the illustrious class, they're very much designed around the rear admiral's staff, rather than a vice admiral's or full admiral's staff. And you might be going, well, Alex, toss the difference here. Just think about this. A rear admiral will be in charge of a squadron, maybe a small task group. A vice admiral could well be in charge of a task force with coordinating multiple task groups within that. Multiple squadrons. A full admiral certainly will be in charge of a task force, if not multiple task forces. Two star, three star, four star. As you can imagine, with those increases in rank and requirements of their job, their staff grows exponentially as they are meant to manage upwards as much as they manage downwards. And the higher you get, the more you have to deal with the political layer and the media and all the other annoying things that come up when you get more senior in ranks. And things which, honestly, officers who've been spent their entire career being trained how to lead fleets in war and fight in wartime are going to be bad at and need more support in. There was actually once a um, an exercise run by a friend of mine. It was a war game exercise. And they were running through World War Two, and they, they had her proposed sister, Unicorn's proposed sister, which was going to be Ocean. We're not 100% sure, but that seems to be the, the name roughly going around the planned sort of idea of name of the next one to be ordered. Having her ordered at the same time as Unicorn, but Unicorn completed as a maintenance carrier, Ocean completed as a command carrier. Now... <coughs> I had the conversation with my friend and about, you know, how that would happen, and they basically ran the scenario of Henderson living a bit longer. And Henderson persuading Churchill that to A, not pause the carrier's construction, and B, uh, we need to complete these two ships, but we don't have one, we don't have a major task force carrier. We need one which is actually a command carrier. And I went, I'm not sure about that. He said, and his exact response was, well, how about we do an scenario that he, as he gets these as compromises for the pauses on the illustrious class, but also gets indefatigable and implacable to carry on being built. 
Yeah, I'll accept that. That's, by the way, a really interesting thing, because Illustrious probably starts up and gets completed as it should, but if Indefatigable and Implacable aren't paused, they could well come into service in 1941. The others aren't paused at the same time, that's fine. But these could also come into service in 1941, uh, you know, 1941. Implacable and Infatigable could be late 1941, early 1942 time. So you could have both these available a year, two years earlier, and you could have the Implacables available a couple of years earlier, and one of the, uh, you know, both the illustri uh, Unicorns, as it says, and one of them would be a Command Carrier. And the amount of interesting things that opens up for Fleet Command, especially for the Eastern Fleet and the Pacific Fleet, you suddenly save a lot of trouble. And again, this is pretty much the perfect model for that. Also, basically, it was a command slash maintenance carrier. Or rather, command support, command, AVA, what was he calling Because, of course, Unicorn's a forward aviation support ship, not a, a carrier. I think he called her a forward aviation command ship, a fax ship. So there was the forward aviation support ship. The FAS and the FAX. And came up with a song at one point during the, the war game of the FAX and the FAX. Uh, the FAS and the FAX of life. It was a whole thing. Anyway, she carries on being useful at the end of the war, carrying out with operations of Japan and supporting the withdrawal of troops from the Far East. She carries on in the post-war, where she goes out to support operations of the Far East during the Korean War. She is incredibly useful for the Royal Navy for her entire career, even though it's a career which literally lasts till 1750, till 1953, 17th of November 1953, and she's scrapped on the 15th of June 1959. The Royal Navy tries to hang on to her for longer. They really do, because Unicorn is a useful asset if you want to have global reach on a budget. Because instead of you having to build, rent, or secure deep maintenance facilities everywhere else in the world to support your operations, your global reach, you take them with you. You can sustain, with a vessel like Unicorn supporting your aircraft carriers, you can sustain operations anywhere in the world. That's the advantage of it. With that in mind, let's consider a conclusion. That's not necessarily the easiest thing in the world to do, because the conclusion can be very simple. She was very good at the job she was designed for, and conceived for, supporting and sustaining fleet aviation operations worldwide. She was also pretty darn useful in the job her design would be... Let's go for the phrase adapted rather than copied, pasted with sections deleted for. Um, adapted for. She's very useful in all those missions, in all those operations. And I didn't even cover the, in the video today the fact that during the Korean War she decides to bombard the coast. She doesn't use aircraft. No, she uses her guns, okay? Go to the key ships video if you want more about that. She's a truly capable asset and a really useful ship. A phrase I use often, but ships, when they are used in the roles they are intended for, often turn out to be very useful, because they often turn to be uh, turn out to be well designed for the role they're intended for. It's the ships which are being used in roles which they aren't intended for, which and how useful they prove in those roles that you can say is the measure of a ship, but isn't really. It's the measure of. How much extra functionality did the ship designers manage to fun uh, and conceivers manage to work into their ship? That's what it's truly the measure of. 
We've been seeing a, a lot of discussions recently of drone ships and LHDs and all these things. And whilst I find it a little bit of humorous that people are literally reinventing the aircraft carrier. Because as drones grow in size, that is what you'll end up with. Or rather, the full, uh, this is a forward aviation support ship. I keep having to remind my myself, even myself, it just looks so like an aircraft carrier, but... Bad Alex. It's a forward aviation support ship. You eventually end up with an aircraft carrier. Illustrious. But the point is, for a lot of those roles, what you're mostly looking at in terms of aircraft these days, in the support of aircraft, and what... Aircraft carriers or aviation support ships do is maintenance. That's the big thing for them. They are there to maintain that air group, to maintain those aircraft, to sustain those operations, so they can operate from as close to the enemy as they possibly can. This is especially true in supporting land warfare, but even in sea warfare and naval operations, they are about providing sustained aviation over a certain area. And that's where Unicorn really comes in handy. Now, here's the small thing. She is ordered late 1939, and we can say the Abyssinia crisis was really pushing things forward. But that was in 1935. The earliest she probably could have been ordered is 1937, after the... Second London Naval Treaty has really ceased to function. Uh, basically, they had a cut of, uh, had a clause in the treaty that if Italy and Japan hadn't signed up by April the first, I think it was nineteen thirty seven, from memory. So please don't quote me on that one. I've done a whole video about it, but yeah, I think it's April the first, but I'm not one hundred percent sure. If they haven't signed up to it, then the clause is, the escalator clause are triggered. So imagine if she'd been ordered in 1937, and a sister ordered in 1938, and a third one ordered in 1939. They're forward aviation support ships, so they're not aircraft carriers. They've done everything they can to fit within the tre treaty definitions of auxiliaries. Their guns, their speed, everything's aligned to that one. And judging the fact they'd probably take about two years to enter service. The 1937 one could well be entering service in 1939. 1938 one could be as close as illustrious was to entering service. Could be it could be very quickly into service in 1940. Even with the pause. 1939 one probably would come out the same as Unicorn if the, if the pause went ahead. How useful do you think that would be? You see, to my mind. Something like this, as an aircraft sustainment, especially once the Mediterranean is blocked off and they're going around the Mediterranean, around the sort of the Africa to get to the Mediterranean. One of these operating, supporting of Illustrious and her operations, and Eagle and her operations in the Mediterranean would be absolutely critically useful. The other one? Well, their top speed's 24.5 knots, so you don't really want them for Force H. But probably, considering how high and big they are, they could be helping out with the North Atlantic patrols. The far ships trying to keep uh, the German far ships bottled up. But I'd love to hear your opinion, because... As said, I strongly believe the design was well worked upon before 1935. And from my own notes, Stanley Goodall seems to involve earlier than him becoming Director of Naval Construction. I think whilst Johns, that's Arthur Johns, who's Stanley Goodall's predecessor, um, he serves as Director of Naval Construction 1930 to 1936. They have a lot of overlap and work between them, and they both work well with Henderson, who is the Third Sea Lord 1933 to 1939 when he dies. I think there's a lot of progress on these plans during that time. 
I think there's a lot of development there. So I think it could have been ordered earlier. That it wasn't is probably a political judgment on what they can actually get through at the time and how much effort they can put through to getting it through. And yes, Henderson does spend a lot of 1938 pushing this to get this bill ordered in 1939. So I think the question is, I'm going to ask, is, you know, if, if the Abyssinia crisis serves a better argument for it, and if they manage to push it further, let's say around the Inskip Award and all these other things, the treaty ends, they order their first of these in April the 2nd, 1937. And the second one about... Well, let's go for February 1938. And the third one... Let's say January 1939. Which is not impossible, because these are additional orders, so they're going to be slightly out of the normal run of things and ordering priorities. What do you think the impact is on World War II? What do you think happens? Do you think one of them gets... Con are you like my fr good colleague and friend? Who, uh... We will call Philip. Are you like Philip? Do you believe one of them gets completed as a command carrier? Which I wouldn't put past Henson, because let's be honest, he does that with the tribals. Um, or do you think they all get completed as fleet forward, a uh, forward aviation support ships rather than forward aviation command ships? Or do you think they all get completed in a... You know, the second one that's completed is completed in a rush without some of her aviation support assets, so she's closer to a carrier than an aviation support ship, whereas the first one's probably, let's be honest, if it's laid down in April 1937, it is probably already completed and in her full aviation support role. Might even already be serving in an Indian Ocean or something like that as a vessel, uh, as a suitable space to send her. I'd love to hear your opinions and what you think might have happened. Anyway, what have we got coming up next? Next week is... The War Emergency Ships. Ooh, that'll be fun. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And um, thank you. And if you like the videos, please do like, share, and subscribe. I always love to share my love of naval history with more people. That really helps it. And if you want to help support the book habit, which keeps us all in the way, then please, Patron, Kofi, memberships of the channel, they or Super Chat, Super Thanks, they all, all go towards it. Apart from Kofi, that goes to my Iron Brew Addiction, which supplies this channel in other ways. Thank you very much for the support. Thank you very much for watching and hope you enjoyed. Take care.